good evening everybody and welcome to this 100th episode of uh, marvelous medicine thank you so much for the enthusiastic response it's been uh, two years but it just seems like yesterday when uh, radha krishna called me and said hey what are you doing during lockdown you seem to be on whatsapp all the time and uh, why don't you start doing something useful and uh, that's how this got started i never thought i last even uh, four weeks but here we are we were two years uh, down the line and it's thanks thanks to each one of you who participated in uh, one or more of the sessions either as speaker or moderator or as audience um so today i am going to just sit back and relax and uh, uh, puneet and the others will be handling the show so uh, over to you uh, puneet hi i think pata you are introducing uh... radha krishna sorry <clears throat> over to you i'm so hi. used to calling on you at the end <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's a privilege to introduce uh, professor nandi the doyen of uh, uh, gi surgery in india and uh, and he is one of those unique uh, uh persons who have both an frcp and mrcs and i think is one of uh, maybe less than half a dozen such individuals in the country and he's been my teacher mentor he he has been a professor head of gastric surgery in dolan institute of science so interrupt uh, 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 rather can you mute everyone temporarily can you please mute everyone temporarily i'll do that so it's my privilege to present uh, professor nandi who's a man of uh, multiple talent is a great writer speaker innovator researcher teacher and uh, a media person professor nandi so what do you want me to say uh, say bye yeah do you want me to say about my favorite patient or do you want me to say how great this program is both <laughs> yeah, uh, how not so great the program is also sir because we need to improve <laughs> no i was looking through vidya your list of subjects and i think they are very interesting but they're not controversial enough and i think that there are many subjects that we could do which on this program which are uh, interesting to discuss i mean um including the um, fall of the private uh, public sector in india and the rise of the private sector and why um people flock to the private sector rather than go to the public sector second is our, our um, obsession with technology and how everyone wants to do uh you know robotics and they want to compare robotic and they don't think about cost and effectiveness and i think that there are many other things that and corruption and one could talk about things like um how the medical system healthcare system is based largely on corruption and we have uh, done books a book on this which is a best seller and all these things i should be incorporated it would be a good thing in marvelous medicine because it all it affects all of us and we should be approaching the our problems in a different way uh thank you sir i will uh, get back to you about this uh, in the near future we are the, we are doing a session on this uh, um work life balance whether it is a reality or myth or is is it achievable at all so after that we'll take on uh, the subjects that you have uh, uh, suggested sir i will be in touch with you to um organize the session thank you so much for your feedback sir yes pata ha huh. professor nandi professor nandi i'd like to hear about one patient of yours who's affected you the most in a good way or a bad way yeah i'll tell you about my the my most memorable patient it was uh, many years ago when i used to go to balabgar uh, to a small um, place in all india which is run by the all india institute 
about 40 kilometers, I used to take the undergraduates. And I'd come from America full of, um, you know, investigations and all that. And I was boasting to them that you show me a patient and I will make a diagnosis. There was no X-ray, ultrasound, or anything in those days, just simple blood tests. Just show me a patient, any patient here, and I'll make a diagnosis. So a little boy, about 10 or 11, was very sick, and he was lying in bed, and the father was with him. And he had a huge tummy, which was very painful. And I asked the father about the history, what happened? So he said, this boy, he's always playing around. He had a big lump on the left side of his abdomen. And it, after that, I don't know, he was playing and it burst or something. So I thought that he probably had a um, splenic rupture yeah. Yeah. because I was interested in portal hypertension. And the father didn't know much. So I called his mother. Mother came and said that this boy had this lump since birth and he'd been bored, gored by a bull. And after that, his tummy had swelled. So I asked the residents, the um, undergraduates, what single test would you do to make the diagnosis? So they didn't know. So I said, you put a needle into the abdomen and see if there's blood uh, or pus. So they put a needle in the abdomen and bloody fluid came out. So then I said, well, it looks a bit like urine. And how would you test for urine? So they said, oh, you said for creatinine, urea, and all this. I said, no, you smell it. And we smelt it, and it was urine. So this chap obviously had a congenital hydronephrosis, got by a bull, burst. And in Balabgar, without, assisted by these wretched undergraduates, I operated on him and took out his left kidney. And as luck would have it, he did well, went home. Two years later, I was sitting in the outpatients in All India Institute in Delhi, when two poor people came in with a boy and said, <coughs> this is the boy you operated on two years ago, and now he's got fever. So I said, oh God, I thought that he probably got pyonephrosis on the other side and referred him to the urologist. The urologist, I, two days later, I asked the urologist, did you see this boy? He said, no, it didn't come. The mother came and said that whatever's to be done for the boy, you are going to do it. You're the only person in the world we trust. So I admitted him and read up all how to do pelvic ureteric substitution and all that. And we did tests and found out he had malaria. We gave him anti-malarials and he went home. I never saw him again. And there are two lessons I learned. I learned that you can't be too overconfident about diagnoses. You have to be a little humble. And the second was that it is wonderful to be a doctor in India. The gratitude of patients is absolutely something that you carry till the end of your days. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, I'll take uh, privilege in uh, welcoming Dr. Anant Krishnan, our teacher. And he's one of those uh, renowned pedagogues in surgery and has done a lot in terms of surgical education. Uh, Dr. A.K. to comment on this program. Thanks, Pata. Thanks a lot. I'm unable to turn on my video because of bandwidth issues. And good evening uh, to Dr. Nandi. Good evening. Nice to hear you, sir, after such a long time. I mean, is he there still? Yeah, yes, he is there, yes. Yeah. Oh, it's good, uh, Pata. I've been following your programs uh, quite closely for a long time. And you've been uh, able to pull me into two or three of those. And uh, I find them very refreshing most of the time except when uh, I disagree with some of the issues which are, are being raised and then uh, I voiced my opinion in the past, including the last 
and but on the whole i find it very educative and uh, i don't know about controversies which dr nand talks about but certainly the topics are very current and uh, very open to debate and uh, very educative and uh, you've done a great job and i put it up in the uh, facebook also and so does uh, vidya and of course the backroom boys ravi and the others and uh, you have run the show now for a long time it uh, helped us to tide through covid in those dark days and uh, with nothing much to do except to watch the computer or the tv and uh, please keep it going and uh, maybe we should get into controversies also as dr nandi says and we have different opinions particularly about private and public education i have been in the public field for uh, nearly 35 years and in the private field now after that another 15 years so i have seen both sides of the coin and i know uh, what is what and what happens maybe we should discuss it sometime thank you sir over to punit welcome all to the centurion episode and as uh, you know i came on the 100th participant has also joined so we are exactly at 100 Uh, this has been a marvelous uh, series, which uh, you know started from learning general surgery, Pata, and then Vidya going on to this. Uh, and I've been an avid uh, follower. If I, if I don't see it online, I catch up on on you know. And the, <coughs> even in times of death by webinar, it's a pleasure to go through this. And after listening to two of my favorite seniors from my field, uh, Professor Nandi and Professor Anand Krishnan, uh, we move on to another. You know, the, the we in this series of ten short stories. uh the first person we have is uh, uh professor reela uh mohammad is chairman and director of the reela institute of medical center in china chennai uh his uh, basic medical and surgical training was from stanley uh and then he went on to do the ms and frcs from uk and was a professor of liver surgery and transplantation at kings college for many years uh, when we had a queen there uh he's been a pioneer in pediatric liver transplantation auxiliary transplantation split liver transplant techniques he's also entered the guinness book of records for doing the uh, transplant in a 5 day old baby and has uh, you know humongous uh, more than 600 scientific publication uh he's you know we normally think of surgeons as jocks but he's added a cerebral dimension to it uh even in fields which are not uh, related to medicine he is an expert on the kamba ramayana which is obvious from his name and has spoken and written extensively on it as well uh welcome uh, mohammed and uh, over to you thank you puneet and thank you patta for um, inviting me i mean you asked me to talk about um, um the most memorable patient i think there there were many actually um the the disasters are the ones um you remember more and um patients who have given you the most heartache the most difficult patients is what you remember more but um, most people will have stories like that as well um i have to say that um i don't know how many years 40 years in medicine i haven't been sued once by anybody i haven't had to go to court once um i've had to go to a coroner's court to explain uh, an unexplained unexplained death uh, wasn't a complaint from the pat patients but it was a hospital policy to refer it to the coroner um i've had complaints about <laughs> uh, in the uk as well as here but um um nothing nothing serious has happened to me so far so i've been i've been pretty lucky that um, i've never had to face the legal system for my practice um i've had a couple of very tough um uh, very tough patients who have uh, given me very hard time but um, none of them have taken me to court but i i want to talk about um the two you probably have heard of that one you said is a, the the five day old um and and another case and i wanted to talk about these because it's changed the course of my practice um i did uh, general surgery in stanley and um i went to the uk and did many middle grade registrar jobs i've done vascular surgery and urology mainly um didn't really achieve um, uh, a level of uh, jobs that would uh, give me a permanent position there and uh, finally i moved to kings college hospital to do liver because <laughs> it was not such a popular specialty and um i went to do liver 
And um, in liver, then I started doing pediatric transplants uh, and pediatric hepatobiliary, which was a very strange thing for many people because I wasn't a trained pediatric surgeon. Hi, Gauri. Hello. Yeah, uh, Gauri, how are you? Difficult to catch you. I'll, I'll stop there. There is somebody in between. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, Pediatric uh, liver surgery is where I went into, and I certainly had, I can tell you there was a professor from um, a big uh, pediatric surgeon from PGI Chandigarh, who actually saw me do a liver transplant, and then I came out and sat in the coffee room, and he asked me, what qualifies you to do operation on such a small child? <laughs> so... There were, there were many, many instances of people asking me, why would you want to do pediatrics? Um, and I can tell you uh, what, changed, what changed my life and what, how people got confidence in it. I'm going to uh, share this as the first case which introduced me to uh, pediatric surgery. This was an eight, there was an eight year old girl who had a um, tumor in the liver, which is centrally located um, and uh, all the three hepatic veins were converging into this uh, tumor. It was deemed inoperable, and the only option was to do a liver transplant. Uh, biopsy, it was actually a pheochromocytoma, an extra adrenal. It's actually a retroperitoneal. It looks like a liver tumor, but it was from the caudate and surrounding tissue and pushing into the liver. This patient was explored by one of the most famous surgeons in the UK. Uh, he was called Lewis Spitz. I don't know if you have heard of him. He was the head of Great Ormond Street. The, it's like the mecca of pediatric surgery. It's like ICH in Chennai, but much more sophisticated ICH in, um, in London. And he said, this cannot be resected. He sent it to us, to King's College Hospital, and said that this needs a transplant. But when Professor Spitz says this is unresectable, it's unresectable. So we listed this patient for a transplant. But I had an idea that this child need not have a transplant. But I was appointed only two years or three years before that. I was a very junior surgeon, probably around 37 years of age at that time. Um, and I couldn't tell anybody I could resect it. So what I did was accepted an organ for this child and had a backup child in case I could resect it. That was a very bold thing to do, but I could do the bold thing because if something went wrong, I could have gone ahead and done a transplant. So I had the backup for a transplant. So I removed this liver and on the bench. So these were, at that time in the UK, probably only one other extra X vivo surgery had been done. Uh, so I took the liver out and the tumor was in the back. You can see the picture of it. The three hepatic veins were just pushed by this tumor. I resected it and re-implanted this liver. And the child did well. And I, in the same day, I used that liver for the backup child. That's when people noticed that I could be a good pediatric surgeon, pediatric liver surgeon. So that is something which uh, changed, of course. I mean, this publication came seven or eight years afterwards. And you can see Lewis Spitz as one of the authors of, um, our authors of this paper. So really sometimes, I mean, this was done when my colleague was not around and uh, Casey Tan was not around. So opportunity sometimes comes um, when you don't have a senior support, when you have to prove yourself. If you had a senior support, you couldn't prove yourself because they would have helped you. Um, and, and, and that's what happened to me one or two times, and, and the second example is this child um, who was a five-day-old child. This family lost two children to congenital hemochromatosis, and we knew when the child was born that the child also had a congenital hemochromatosis. An organ came up. My senior colleagues were not there at that time, and I did a transplant, and this child really survived, and this again changed my life, and um, uh, who was a, I was a very young surgeon, less than 40 years of age. And um, to see that in the UK, almost every newspaper had this as an article 
uh, at that time was um, an extraordinary thing for me. And uh, it may be a memorable thing for that time, but what's, what's important for this is, this case has proved to the world that this is the girl who was transplanted when she was 22, she's now 24 and is, she's studying law, proved to the world that such young children transplanted can go through without any complication. She's never had a CT scan in her life. She's on absolutely minimal immunosuppression, leading a completely normal life. And many ask a question, what happens in the long term when you have a transplant? And India, again, when I say that I have an interest in pediatric transplant, this question often arises, how long is the life expectancy? And I've been able to use this girl as an example of how well one can be after transplant. In fact, after coming to India, I invited her to Chennai and showed her, showcased her, um, not, to, not to show that I've done a fantastic job, but to show to the world that transplantation can be done and patients can do extremely well. And that's the girl with, the, with um, our uh, previous uh, chief minister and the health minister and the health secretary there. So I think uh, these two cases probably are memorable to me because they changed the course of my uh, career and um, made people realize that uh, I can be a, you can be a good organ-based, I've always argued that uh, you can be a good organ-based surgeon rather than just uh, pediatric surgeons doing very complex hepatobiliary surgery. I think adult uh, hepatobiliary surgeons can do pediatric hepatobiliary surgery well and I've stuck to that fact. Um, and that has helped me really prove the point for the rest of the world. I think I stopped there. Um, I, maybe you should have um, another meeting to say disasters that has affected you most. Then I can give you uh, many examples of how disasters have affected, the mo affected me the most. And uh, they, are, they are a much bigger heartache than these uh, cases, which has really helped with your career. Thank you very much. Absolutely, Mohammed. Then uh, my own favorite story uh, about Professor Ela is about. Uh, uh, I think we should have that as an episode. Is about uh, how he used uh, uh, chimerism, and you know, I think we'll have a session on that sometime. Uh, and with that, we move on. We've have a slight change in program. Uh, the second speaker uh, would be introduced by uh, Dr. Ravi Shankar. Uh, unmute yourself, Ravi. Unmute yourself, please. Yeah, so D Dr. Asha, my apologies. I am being pulled into a different meeting. Um, so um, uh, apologies for going out of uh, sequence. Uh, but if I wanted to start with Dr. Asha, the first thing that comes to mind is this thing that goes, Pani illa da mar margaria, can you have uh, a month of December without due? The same way we cannot think of Jipma without Dr. Asha. She's been um, uh, faculty at Jipma for her entire academic career and my entire um, association with JIPMA has uh, included uh, Dr. Asha in some way or the other. Um, as uh, all of you may or may not know, she's a, a, an a OBGYN from uh, Pondicherry, whom we think um, is a teacher of teachers, the mentor of mentors, and a really a great role model to many of us. Um, she has the uh, distinction of being a student of JIPMA in the sense that she did her MBBS from JIPMA, her um, MD in OBGYN from All India Institute, and then came back to JIPMA. What's very interesting uh, about her, in addition to that, is this fabulous memory she has for people and faces. She can, uh, you know, it's almost like she pulls out names and uh, um, anecdotes out of a hat. Um, uh, from way back when that even the individual person forgets what they've done. She's a very gifted surgeon and Vidya tells me that she's one of the most uh, uh, truly ambidextrous surgeons that she as an anesthetist has ever met. So that must be something. She's extremely passionate about teaching, has written books for both um, written and edited chapters, books uh, for undergraduate and postgraduate uh, uh, trainees and is a great administrator 
most people who are good clinicians generally um, are not organized enough to become uh, good at administration, but she's an exception to that role, uh, to that rule. And most importantly, she's extremely passionate about Hindustani music and continues to train in vocal music even today. So without further ado, Dr. Asha. Ma'am, please unmute yourself. Dr. Asha, please unmute yourself. Uh, Dr. Asha, you need to unmute it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Great. Greetings to all of you. Thanks, Ravi Shankar, for all the good things you said about me. And I must thank Vidya for asking me to narrate the story of my most memorable, unforgettable patient. This was way back in 1973-74. I had just got back from Ames after my MD and joined as a senior resident. And uh, we had a JIPMAR unit working in the government maternity hospital at that time. And uh, if you go back those 50 years, we used to have something like 20 to 30 deliveries a day, and at least about five to six, sometimes 10 emergencies. And uh, what was one of the most tragic emergencies that we used to see was the rupture of the uterus. I'm sure many of you youngsters may not have seen it, but it's the honestly the most catastrophic outcome of labor because of mechanical factors. The uterus, the power keeps on working. The lower segment gets thin and the uterus ruptures. In such cases, the child is almost always dead. And sometimes we lose the mother also. If the mother is alive, then she's left with no uterus and you can imagine what life would be for her. So it was one of these emergency days. Around 10 o'clock at night, I admitted this ruptured uterus, took her up for laparotomy. At head end, I had a senior resident, my colleague from JIPMA. Can never forget his name, Dr. Ravindra. So I opened up, achieved hemostasis after hysterectomy. Then he suddenly said, uh, you know, Asha, there's cardiac arrest. So I told him, you give external cardiac massage resuscitation, I'll wait. So I was holding on. Then he said, after a while, heartbeat is not coming back. He said, can you do an internal cardiac massage? I looked at him because I didn't know what it was really. And then he said, you know, the tenderness uh, leaf of uh, left uh, left tenderness leaf of diaphragm, I said, yes. So I extended my incision. Anyway, we used to always take a right paramedian, extended it, went along, felt what I thought was the tenderness leaf. And he said, make a nick. I made a nick and he said, can you feel the heart? I said, yes. So he said, just keep pumping, massaging and we'll see what happens. I did it. And to my utter surprise, he told me, now the heart is beating. And after a while, he said, you stop. And then it took over. And uh, I had to inform my senior. She was Dr. Prabhavati, another very good surgeon from whom I learned a lot. You must be knowing her daughter, Dr. Kadambari, who is now the professor of surgery in Jipma. So I sent word for her. She came, she peeped through the window. She said, what happened? I said, this is what happened. So he, she said, oh, you cut the diaphragm, just suture it and she walked out. Anyway, I closed up and <laughs> I closed up and you know, I'm laughing now, but that time I think I could have just cried. Then uh, sutured up everything, put in post-op ward because there was no other intensive care unit or anything like that those days. I sat with the patient keeping a watch on her pulse and whatever, then we kept taking ECG now and then. 
next day morning also she seemed fine as somebody said you know we didn't have much of uh, diagnostic aids we took an x-ray chest there was some pneumonitis i believe ecg was normal every day i used to make sure ecg was taken for whatever reason and you will not believe like any other patient we removed her sutures on the eighth day and she went home she walked back home and i'll never forget her even if this episode and i think she was a real marvel i admired and appreciated that day how much in the strength a human body has how much it can bear and how much it can tolerate because these women are as it is they are anemic and they lose so much blood in rupture the uterus because blood flow to the uterus is increased some 10 times or more during pregnancy they lose so much blood the cardiac arrest and with whatever resuscitation we do they survive she survived not only survived but she walked back home so this is my most unforgettable patient thank you very much but before i end for this 100th episode i think radha and patta need to be honored in some way i have put this earlier on some other forum but i don't know if it's happened because i am not there for most of the sessions as i have some other thing occupied this time thank you very much vidya patta and everybody thank you thank you so much dr arsha and uh, with that uh, you know uh, goosebump story as suma put it Uh, we move on to uh, our next uh, speaker who's managed to you know uh, solve one of the problems of our rural setup he set up an icu and to introduce him we have dr raghavendran uh, good evening everyone thank you dr puneet i deem it a great honor and privilege to introduce the next speaker dr n ganapati who had qualified from uh, sally medical college as an anesthesiologist but somehow ventured into intensive care services and established in the icu in a two tier uh, city like uh, you know hero it's in tamil nadu and has treated a lot of uh, people who are victims of uh, you know snake bites i uh, saw in the in, in the, one of this uh, uh, information uh, um, given that more than 5000 cases and also poisoning cases which was quite common in the area it seemed so and this icu actually had it been well equipped with all the um, essential facilities from what it was including a ecmo and real replacement therapies and other essential equipment he has delivered a lots of lectures in, on poisoning and snake bite uh, treatments in uh, in the most a lot of uh, conferences and seminars in not only in india but also in neighboring countries like uh, sri lanka bangladesh and nepal and other places He is he's, he's got a hospital known as Dalmantri Hospital, and uh, has been uh, running it since 1986, and has become a center of excellence. He's also running a college of nursing and allied health services, and he is well supported by his family members, who are all doctors, and totally uh, solidly behind him in all his efforts to serve the poor and needy. Over to Dr. N. Ganesathy. i'm geeta ingar a writer by profession and i'm very closely associated with nalini she's my niece actually i'd never heard about disease called hemophilia it's only yeah is it audible yes sir yeah uh, my unforgettable patient wherever the art of medicine is slow there is also a love of humanity hippocrates a short summary a 11 year old boy brought to our hospital in the middle of the night from the nearby government hospital following snake bite he was intubated already in the government hospital vitals were stable patient was completely unresponsive 
all brain stem reflexes were absent, looking like a brain death victim. MRA brain was normal with good blood flow to the brain. And about the snake, one of the poisonous snake is a creek, which has got a nocturnal habit and it bites the victim only in the night. As the fans are soft, it does not produce any pain, swelling or mark at the bitten site. The patient becomes areflexic and has got fixed dilated pupils. So the patient should not be diagnosed as brain dead. So this is a normal fan of other poisonous snake. This is a small, short, spongy fan of the crane. So you cannot, cannot it won't be painful or you cannot see the fang marks. This is a cray snake, which usually has the nocturnal habit. And this snake, normally, uh, it won't come in the day and it will be in a cool climate like a bathroom in the hut. It comes only in the night for its prey. Normally in the village, people, they lie outside for a cool climate and this snake comes and uh, bites these people and uh, they were not aware that it is a snake bite and mostly they think it is a cerebral hemorrhage or it is a brain death. And how to prevent, you just have to uh, use a mosquito net like this and so that the snake will not come in and uh, they will not be harmed by the snake. So coming uh, to the patient, Till 14 days, no reflexes were there. Patient's father was reluctant to continue and he wanted us to initiate for withdrawal of supports. The next day, the boy slowly moved his right hand fingers and from then, gradually he gained his cough reflex and pain reflex. Prolonged ventilation, infection, critical illness, polyneuropathy, all these struggles were confirmed. Of course, we, he was on uh, CRRT, dialysis, uh, plasma physics, hemoperfusion and everything. Gradually, we weaned him from the ventilator and extubated him on day 28. Vigorous physical rehabilitation with good nutritional support was given. He was happily discharged after 40 days. This kid now is in eighth standard. Regularly wishes all of us in the hospital. So as the previous doctor told the professor, medicines can cure diseases, but only doctors can cure the patients. So our take-home message is never give up. Have a good team of doctors and staff nurses. Communication is the most important key and always show kindness and empathy. Because I was from Stanley Medical College, I have not seen a single case of snake bite till my MD. Only after coming to IMO, my main ambition is to be only in the rural area. That was my main thing. And I started this six. Even they have not started either in upper area. And my professor of teaching was who came from states and he encouraged me to start the ICU. So we, we get so many cases like this because why I have shown the movie of the same because people who are in uh, uh, city, they would not have, and this is one of my interesting cases. Thank you for giving me an opportunity, uh, both for this marvelous medicine and uh, Dr. Vidya and all my doctor professors. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Personal goosebumps for me because uh, uh, I almost, while on a nocturnal burning trip in the Andamans, I almost stepped on an Andaman crate while we were looking for owls. And that would have made an owl of me as well. Uh, with that, we move on to our next speaker and to introduce uh, uh, this, uh, you know, perfect combination of gynecology and andrology is uh, uh, Dr. Tilaka. Thank you, sir. I can't be more privileged to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Pandya Natarajan, one of the pioneers in the field of andrology and reproductive medicine whose contribution to the field 
has not just helped couples enjoy the dream of parenthood, but also has largely helped the field of reproductive medicine itself in its growth. An extremely ethical physician, uh, an extremely ethical physician, a perfectionist by nature, a leader by example, but most importantly, I think everybody who knows him will agree that one of the most warmest, humblest, and the most amazing person that one can know. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Over to you. Well, I'm rather nervous. I'm used to long talks condensed in five minutes. I'll try my best. Congratulations on this 100th episode. And thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this wonderful program. Let me just share my slides. Uh, I'm to see if they can make the full screen. At the bottom of the screen, there is an image like a cup, sir, uh, uh, okay. or a screen that, that will be bottom of the screen towards. Yeah, 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 I sir. got it. Yes. Okay, can you all see me now? Yes, sir. Okay, well, when I had this invitation some time back, so many patients came to my mind. It is a good travel down the memory lane because I've been in the field for 50 years now. I've shortlisted four of them. And then I decided to talk about two probably ethical issues. Two patients contributed to first time techniques being developed in the world. One is about another concept, one is on post moral contraception. My gynecologist friends will know about it. And other is on spermatozoa retrieval techniques and freezing, which opened up the gate for fatherhood for many men. Two patients posed great ethical challenges. Because of the mixed audience, I'll probably sh share these two um, uh, challenges. As all of you are familiar, ethics is the final frontier. Technology can keep growing endlessly. We may reach a Mars, but ethical frontiers still keep troubling us all the time. And ethics is primarily a human invention. It's primarily to protect the weak and vulnerable from the strong. It keeps changing from time to time, place to place, from people to people. What was not ethical 100 years back is ethical now. You know the abortion story. Who decides what's ethical? We tend to put the blame on the society, the world, the professional body, no. You and me, and all of us, one way or other. Either we do it ourselves, or we are part of a society which does it, or the government. So ultimately, we have to take responsibility, and if something is not acceptable, we have to represent. Ethics is very simple, as all of you know, but not easy to practice. And we are going through a revolution in reproduction. Sex and reproduction has been delinked. It is possible to reproduce without sex and to have sex without reproduction. In my own chosen field of ethical reproduction, we're reading with an ethical mind field. There are so many ethical issues which have still not been sorted out. And we are all familiar with the heterosexual two-party reproduction. We become uncomfortable and unfamiliar with single-party reproduction, third party, fourth party, fifth party, and now we have gone up to six-party reproduction. And remember, infertility is a crisis in the lives of many, many people. You may be wondering, there are healthy people. They are apparently healthy people, but crying every day of their life. And the problem is in the man, it is worse because man's ego and pride is hurt. Unfortunately, the woman bears a cross even when he is at fault. So this story is about a 25-year-old man who came to me in 1988. I was 35 years. There were no guidelines anywhere in the world. HFEA, which is the first body to start putting guidelines, as Human Fertilization Employees Authority, was not there. No guidelines in ICMR, and his wife was 22 years. They've been married for two years. He had a condition called Sertoli cell only syndrome, or germ cell aplasia, which means he had no germ cells in his testes as per the biopsy report. They reviewed the biopsy again and found that the story is true. At that time, 88, there are no treatments for it. Subsequent to that, we have been part of teams which develop treatment for these men also, recovering some sperm from the testes and doing ICSI. We counsel them for the option. We always tell our patients what are the choices they have. We told them you can have a child-free state, adopt a baby, or consider heterologous insemination and tell them to go home, think about it, and come back to us. Sure enough, the couple came back and said, we want donor insemination. It was a to me. I thought 
India is very conservative and people are not going to accept donor insemination. Surprisingly, adoption is not so popular. Donor insemination is popular when there's no other alternative. So after counseling, we said we had told them to come after the next cycle to plan treatment for his wife. Three days later, the father came and told me, the husband's father came and told me, I want to be the donor. It was a new awakening for me. In all over the world, I've worked in different countries, couple come to you for treatment and have treatment with you. Strangely in India, you find that couple come with parents on both sides. Sometimes uncles and aunties also want to come inside the room. And this is true even for sexual medicine. I am embarrassed, not whether the patient is embarrassed or not. So we had to talk to them gently and send them outside. So I told the father, things don't work that way. You can't use your sample. It's not legal, it's not ethical. I was trying to dodge the situation. And I need to take your son's consent. So two days later, the son came and said, I have no problem my father donating the seventh sample. Again, I was, at, I was pushed to the wall. I said, no, 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 things can't work that way. Again, I used the same logic and said, look, your wife has to accept. Lo and behold, they came two days later and said, she is accepting. So all the three parties concerned, the father, the son, daughter-in-law. And the daughter-in-law is not the, um, she is a stranger in the sense, before marriage, she didn't belong to the family. So now we have all the three people concerned, willing to proceed with it. What do I do? As usual, you know, we fall back and say, look, I'll go talk to the legal department. I was working in Apollo main hospital. There's only one Apollo at that time. I called the legal department and they spoke to them. The lawyer said, I don't know, sir. I'll talk to my senior lawyer in the high court. Weeks later, they came and said, no guidance. So what do I do? I was struck with a patient who has been fortunate to, or unfortunate to come to me and has persisted with me for the last two weeks. Here is a patient. Then the father got so frustrated. All of them got frustrated because I was not able to make any decision. He asked a very simple question. You're willing to organize some donation for my son unknown source. I said, no, not unknown. They're all altruistic voluntary donors. He said, still, they're unknown to us. Here I am willing, I'm healthy. I have other children who are healthy. My son is willing, my daughter in law is willing. What is your problem? What is this ethics and rules? That really woke me up. Since then, I've been in many ethical committees as chairperson of the ethical committee or member. I always feel this famous Kamala Hassan star movie. And it took out Tirukural, Oimayim, Vaimayitatta, Uraiti in the Nunway Pike, which means if something is going to good to others, it is not going to harm anybody. I think everything is fine. Isn't it so? Am I wrong in dodging doing things for it? Just a quick 30 seconds about this patient a patient with chronic liver failure with infertility sought IVF treatment. She was weightless for liver transplant, but she was not an extremist. She was sort of moving around. I put it to the ethical committee. By then, this is 2012. Ethical committee, this is in Chetinard. Ethical committee said, please go ahead. Your center of excellence should take such challenging cases. And she said, and IVF is a simple procedure, technically, surgically. But there are a lot of preparations. She has to go on hormones. And those was before surrogacy became so rampant and she was not contemplating surrogacy at all. So I not only going through IVF and she also had to carry the baby. So everybody said, go ahead. I declined. So I leave this to you again to tell me, am I wrong in declining? Because I told her, look, I don't want you to die in my hand. It is not right to help you have a baby. You may not have a baby. IVF may not be successful. And even if it's successful, you can't carry the pregnancy. So thank you very much again for tolerating my quick five minutes presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, not only for the stories, but also for seeding us with a lot of thoughts, uh, some of which may be inseminate ideas uh, in for future episodes of Marvelous Medicine. Thank you. Uh, and now we have our, uh, you know, our founder, uh, uh, Pata Radhakrishnan, to introduce an eminent neurosurgeon. Uh, uh, Dr. Pandey, could you please stop sharing your screen, sir? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you. No, it's my privilege uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Suresh Bapu, whom I, whom I rub shoulders with. We work in the same institution. 
I mean, uh, other than a great neurosurgeon, is a lovely human being and a very pleasant man, loved by his patients and, and his colleagues alike. He's been brought up in Madurai and did his MBBS from Madurai Medical College, where he was the best outgoing student in his MBBS. And he was one of the first few Indians, uh, Indian neurosurgeons to get training in micro neurosurgery under Professor Yasser Gill of Switzerland in 1981-82. Uh, Yasser Gill is considered as the father of modern micro neurosurgery. And on return from Zurich, Dr. Suresh Bapu, under the guidance of his professor M. Natarajan in uh, Madurai, has established a micro neurosurgery department, Madurai Medical College, and trained many young neurosurgeons in Madurai between 1984 and 1989. And as a former professor of neurosurgery at Institute of Neurology, Madras Medical College, and Government General Hospital, between 1998 and 2006, he continued to train many young neurosurgeons. In the private sector, he was a senior consultant neurosurgeon at Apollo Hospitals, and uh, since 2014, he is heading the Department of uh, Neurosurgery at Sims Hospital, Vadaparani, and he's been a, a great uh, role model to for many young neurosurgeons. His special fields of interest are surgery for aneurysms and AV malformations, endoscopic surgery for pituitary tumors and skull-based tumors, total excision of cerebral pontine angle tumors, and functional preservation of facial nerve. And uh, he is, his wife is Dr. Sarda Suresh, is a pediatrician and an epidemiologist, and she was the director of uh, ICH Egmore between 2005 and 2010. Over to you, sir, Professor Suresh Bhav. Um, good evening to all. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Uh, Vidya, for uh, calling me and Dr. Uh, Pata for uh, initiating this. I have listened to some of the um, uh, marvelous medicine. Um, webinars and uh, I am really I'm impressed by the, uh, the content of them. And uh, more importantly, Dr. Pata puts that in a WhatsApp post describing who is going to talk. That be as much as well uh, interesting to read. You know, Dr. Pata is a very good uh, story writer and uh, he makes it very interesting to all of us. And Dr. Pata said that uh, I should uh, talk on an unforgettable patient. I thought of only patients uh, uh, with whom we had a bad outcome who gave us a tough time. Uh, is it okay if I tell that or you want me to tell only a good outcome patient, Pata, is it okay? <laughs> anything, anything is all right. Okay, yeah. So, uh, you know, most patients uh, whom we treat, we, uh, we treat them and they go home or uh, whatever outcome comes, we, we remember them for a few, years and then generally we tend to forget. Only when there is an, uh, uh, a lesson we get from the patient's treatment or if there's an emotional attachment, only then we, uh, we try to remember them for many years and it becomes an unforgettable uh, patient. That way, I mean, uh, we have had patients, uh, you know, they are, uh, because I was one of the few neurosurgeons to get training in micro neurosurgery. And my uh, senior professors, some of them, they used to open up the case and then they, uh, they find it difficult to remove the tumor. Then they call me and I go and uh, remove the tumor. That has happened quite a good number of times. But now I remember the patient, the surgery, but I may not even have seen the patient. I may not even know the patient. Like that, no, a lot of things have happened. But uh, I can tell one patient, um, a, a young patient came with a, a MRI scan showing a, a bad tumor like a glioblastoma. You know, glioblastoma is one of the worst tumors one can get. You know, um, Joe Biden's son, Bo Biden, died of a glioblastoma. And a usual survival rate for the glioblastoma patient is only about a, a 12 to 15 months time. Uh, the, uh, Young patient, she came to me in 2008. I operated on her. We didn't even do total excision. We did only subtotal excision for that patient. And then uh, we gave radiotherapy. Post-operatively, the, uh, the husband uh, came to me and asked me how she is. I said, she's okay now. She'll be okay only for a few months. 
and uh, probably usually uh, they get recurrence in uh, and one and a half years or two years, and uh, at that time she come back, she'll come back with the recurrence. Then we may not do anything. But of course, uh, she took it, and then uh, we gave radiotherapy, chemotherapy that goes on for nearly six to eight months time. The patient uh, was okay. Then after uh, four years, the patient came to me. I was very glad. Patient uh, was still alive, and uh, at that time. She, we had a scan repeated that showed uh, a small tumor, but uh, that was not a glioblastoma, that was the radiation induced the meningioma. So we treated that patient with a cyber knife therapy and the patient uh, went on, the patient keeps coming and seeing me once in one or two years, she's still alive. She is alive 14 years after the surgery and uh, that is something great. So. It, uh, I, I thought the patient will not survive even for uh, two years, but the patient is surviving. And when the patient comes to me and, uh, and uh, she looks at me as if uh, I have been life there. I know very well it is not me. It is uh, something above us, uh, which, is, which has uh, saved her. Some immune mechanism, some uh, natural mechanism is working and uh, she is still alive. So I learned a big lesson from that from that patient that uh, whenever we tell a prognosis to the patient, never tell them that uh, the patient is live only for one year or two years. We just tell them the statistics. We tell them that uh, usually the 99% of the patients will die in 12 to 15 months time. Only 1% of the patients will live for longer years. In fact, it, that is the statistics. As per statistics, 1% of the patients they live for uh, more than 10 years, or uh, I mean, long life, long, long survival is possible one person of patients. So that was the one patient whom uh, I thought I should uh, share that. Uh, there, there are so many patients that they don't uh, pay credit to what we do, but this patient, I don't think I am responsible for a long survival, but still she gives the credit to me. So that is something uh, I, I cannot forget that. The other patient, uh, which uh, they gave a tough time for me, it was a pituitary patient whom I operated. The uh, patient uh, came from south with, uh, with visual disturbances. The surgery went on well. At the end of the surgery, there was some uh, CSF leak because there was arachnoid was uh, breached and uh, we packed it and she looked all right. Then uh, uh, we kept the patient in the post-op reward for, uh, for about uh, uh, four hours, we shifted the patient to the regular ward. Then next day morning, I draw the patient. She was a bit confused, so we asked for a sodium. Then uh, I went to the operation theater. And then uh, evening, three o'clock, then again I visited her. She was more drowsy, so she had some fevers. So we suspected some meningitis. So immediately we did a lumbar puncture. And uh, then we diagnosed, she's, she has developed meningitis within 48 hours of surgery. And the patient uh, became progressively, she became bad. So she had to be intubated, tracheostomy was done. She was in ICU for nearly three weeks. Then uh, uh, slowly she regained, but still she was, she was uh, uh, not fully recovered. And uh, because of the financial things, they wanted to go back to the native place and uh, they continued treatment there. And I was inquiring about the patient. There was no reply. Suddenly I got a letter from a lawyer that uh, this patient uh, has been treated and has been made, uh, uh, she is completely, uh, she is a bedridden, bedridden state and all that. They sent a lawyer notice. So I was really shocked because uh, uh, I mean, first time I am receiving like this and uh, this is a, uh, something I have not thought of that. Then I had to go back to the records and uh, found that we had maintained the documentation was perfectly good. And uh, especially I should uh, thank the nurses in the hospital who have written all the details of whenever I, we visited the hospital, visited the patient, they had made notes, they, uh, they had written all the details, even if there's no doctor's notes, the nurse's notes was very useful in giving the reply to the uh, lawyer's notice. And of course, uh, uh, we are able to 
tackled it uh, smoothly and uh, there was i was I, there was no need for me to go to the uh, to the court because the advocates of the hospital they take care of these things but it was a real uh, i had a tough time at that time at those few months it was a really tough for me so i thought this is one of the unforgettable patient uh, uh, i thought i should tell that thank you dr patra for giving me this opportunity thank you so much sir for that those lovely stories and a lot of messages in them uh, and uh, you know when uh, pata and uh, vidya were actually uh, envisaging this uh, uh, this episode uh, suma was one of the first to send uh, a poem and i thought it's it's much more important that she, i hope she says that in her introduction of this uh, uh, teacher of uh, who's delivered many pediatricians actually into this world so my former colleague uh, ped uh, rheumatologist suma balan to introduce dr nalini thank you puni thank you vidya and patna uh, dr nalini was my teacher she was a professor of pediatrics in jipna later on in pims uh, the, in the very interesting thing about dr nalini is that more than just pediatric care she also went into advocacy and she is responsible for starting a hemophilia society in pondicherry and through her actions she has provided a lot of hope and support to many uh, suffering patients and families with hemophilia i wrote a short poem for her uh, about a year back and i thought that would give people some idea of uh, the kind of person that she is so it goes this way i remember the first year with most uh, trepidation the morning board round and the case discussion how thorough had been my evaluation would i win her appreciation she wanted more than just the medical history what were the circumstances of this family was while i was clinical in my summary she hugged the mother with affectionate empathy beat the steroid dependent rotem mitotic was starved gaze of the toddler marasmic the recurrent bleeding schoolboy hemophilic she approached all the needs truly holistic as a professor and a pediatric teacher the energy and zeal are what i remember a few seven phrase those caring and temper her compassion rubs off on every paid student from jipma a long and evolved career with no sign of retirement so many lives touched and so much fulfillment while we anticipate even more achievement let me thank you for everything to our student dr nalini please come on board and talk to us about your most unforgettable patient ma'am you will need to unmute yourself dr nalini you are muted uh, dr nalini you will have to unmute yourself your mic is muted Uh, Patta, can you help with that? Uh, Doctor Nalini, you are still muted. Uh, your mic is off. Radha Krishna, is it possible to remotely unmute? yeah right okay yes ma'am thank you um thank you suma for the kind words you said first of all i'd like to say uh, i have been introduced as a hematologist as a hematologist but i never did dm hematology like the present uh, people my hematology is all self learned and because we had no pediatric hematology at those days in 80s so i whatever i learned was self learning plus i underwent some courses nearby near hospitals i couldn't go abroad because of my family circumstances and also from the lab the pathology lab i would go and learn about hematology and then that is what and my patients or my main source of information uh, i it's almost three decades since i started doing hemophilia why did i start doing hemophilia work i'm still not able to say but one thing i can say is that they needed help the patients the parents needed help and they looked at you 
hoping that you would do something for them. So that is why I started. First 10 years, I was in Jipma. That time, factor was not available. Only plasma used to be available. We used to get very few vials of factor. I would like to talk about a boy, an eight-year-old boy, who was brought to us with, uh, yeah, he was a factor eight deficiency, severe. Uh, he was brought with gastrointestinal bleeding, GI bleed. So we gave him, those days, factor was not available. So we gave him plasma. He settled down for one or two days. Then he started having fever. We were looking for the cause of fever. He used to have high-grade fever. We thought it was plasma-induced infection. Then finally, it turned out to be it was a salmonella infection, typhoid. Typhoid infection, salmonella infection. And he used to bleed almost every second day till the ulcer seed, almost for six weeks. Every alternate day, we had to give him plasma. And then to bring him out, each time he'll go into shock, and then we had to bring him out of the shock and then give him plasma, and he survived. Now he's done his computer engineering, he's working, he's, uh, he's got a baby, he's married, and he's got a baby. After a long time, I recently met him, and he came and touched my feet and said, you are my savior. That is what I need. This saying, this thanks from the children whom I have treated, that is what is always my important thing, which helps me. The second patient was during the second decade. That is, I had shifted out of, shifted out of uh, Jipma into a private institution. There, a one-year-old child was brought with intracranial bleed. bleed. Then, he was operated free there. He, the father didn't have money to buy factor. So we supported him with factor. And we also did fundraising for him by advertising in the newspapers. These days, social media has come in. Those days, we had no social media. So we got some thousand rupees for him to, uh, to look after his needs. And that child, I came to know, had head banging. He used to bang his head on the floor, and that is how he had intracranial bleed. He was operated. Now that boy is in Coimbatore, and he has studied, and then he is do doing his own business. I am very happy about that. Now about a third patient who's been very recent in the last uh, eight, 10 years. He is one of my old patients. He used to come with GI bleed, recurrent GI bleed, and then he had once acute pain abdomen. He was admitted as appendicitis. He was operated in one of the institutions as an emergency where he was being treated. It is a good institution. I wouldn't mention any institutions because some three, four institutions in were involved in this. They had thought of acute appendicitis under adequate fact. We are getting enough factor these days, thanks to the World Federation of Hemophilia. And he was operated. Then they found, they did not find an uh, inflamed appendix, but there was just small hematoma. So, so the surgeon just closed him up. And then we followed him with factor. And then he was discharged. After going home, every week he will bleed. He'll come to the casualty of the treating hospital with two grams hemoglobin. And he would have to be given at least two blood transfusions to bring up his hemoglobin along with factor. Like that, he went on for months together. Uh, GI endoscopy, lower GI endoscopy was done, upper GI endoscopy was done. They could not find the site of bleed. Then I referred him to another referred, referral institution where they treat hemophilia patients. And there also they could not find. MRI did not find a place, everything. But there also he continued bleeding. Then finally the surgeon, the gastroenterology surgeon, we thought we will lose him. I used to tell, I think this boy is going to die. But at, at that institution, the surgeon gave him 5% chances. He said, if you live, I'm going to open you. If you live, you may live. Otherwise, you may die. It's only 5%. The boy and his parents took a risk. Imagine they're also very poor. They spent lakhs. And he was opened. and they did, they resected. 
the heliocecal region and remove that region. And finally, it was sent for biopsy and found it was tuberculosis. Tuberculosis of the heliocecal tuberculosis, which was causing this. And after that, he came, he was so moribund. He came back home. He was in a real moribund state, but now he has recovered and then he has started going back to work. This was a boy who I thought will never survive, but has survived. God is always great. And I am not, I am not worried about anything. I am worried about those children who have come up, who have made their lives. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity. Thank you so much, ma'am, for those stories. Uh, and now the next, we have two pillars of uh, learning general surgery, the parent organization here. Uh, both my favorites, Ilango, a passionate uh, liver transplant surgeon, is going to introduce Professor G.D. Sharma. Um, thank you, Puneet, sir. Um, thank you, Vidya, ma'am, for the opportunity and Bata, sir, for this, pro for this platform. Um, I'm, I, I, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Girijatat Sharma. Um, he's one of the father figures in the learning surgery, general surgery group and serves as a mentor right from the youngest to the oldest. So he is, um, he is an alumnus of CMC Ludhiana under Professor Eggleston and uh, was trained in the American uh, residency system, uh, which was prevalent in, uh, which was used in CMC Ludhiana. And he did his MS in DNB uh, and finished in 1983. He further worked as a lecturer in urology and thoracic surgery. Um, he's probably one of the uh, few general surgeons who can operate on every part from head to toe. Um, Dr. Sharma has extensive experience in running his own hospital and has also worked in corporate hospitals in New Delhi, primarily with the aim of uh, teaching National Board uh, surgical uh, residents. And his specialty is in helping those candidates who have failed their examination um, and getting them uh, trained as a good surgical student. And um, he also specializes in teaching non-surgical skills to the younger students as well as to seniors. And it's always a pleasure to talk to him about problems. And um, um, you should, I mean, a lot of people who are uh, following learning general surgery will see that, see his district surgeon, uh, tips and it's always a, a thriller each time and there's a lot of practical tips in his teaching and um, um, it's uh, in, in Tamil they used to say Na, so it's like uh, he's one of the stars of our program uh, learning general surgery platform and we're always glad to be uh, with him in any place much more so in marvelous medicine over to you sir Is my. We can hear you, sir. Maybe you can just adjust your camera a little bit so that we can see your full face. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Please uh, accept my congratulations on 100th episode, Dr. Vidya and uh, Dr. Patta and Dr. Lingo. Thank you very much for kind words. And and uh, uh, this case goes back when I was 30 years old and I just landed from CMC to a district hospital where they got me a ventilator to begin with, which was my prerequisite, but we didn't have by that time a cardiac monitor in that unit. It was early morning around 4 a.m. My wife was doing a cesarean section and I was assisting her. On head end was one of my classmates who currently heads a unit uh, in Mass Journal in Boston. And we didn't have pediatricians those days. So as the baby was delivered, uh, the anesthesiologist was taking care of the baby and suddenly I noticed, and I said, so 
blood is blue. And then suddenly he picked up the drips and he said, the patient is arrested. It was a young lady, 23, 24 at that time, primary. And uh, this episode is somewhat similar to what uh, uh, Professor Asha had mentioned. So this lady had a cardiac arrest with cesarean section. She was hemodynamically okay. This was not a case of blood loss. Probably retrospectively, it was bradycardia which went unnoticed and the lady had arrest. We did massage her for a while and when we couldn't get the heart beating, I opened chest. The boss who taught me thoracic, he always used to emphasize on the table, all non-hypovolemic arrest uh, used to undergo open cardiac massage. And interesting, I had all the skill, but I did not have the thoracic equipment with me. So we passed the DVR through the intercostal space and rotated it 90 degree. And uh, we broke a couple of ribs to enter, open the pericardium and massaged. Fortunately, within four or five minutes, the lady was revived. And uh, she was put on ventilator. And she was kept in OT for a while. As I came out of OT, there were two young, smart doctors in jeans. I never knew this commoner's brother was some cash accounts officer in GB Pant. So within two hours or one and a half hour, two young residents, one in cardiology, the other in neurology, were in my small district hospital. And after evaluating the lady, they said uh, she is brain dead and uh, she is only fit for organ donation. And uh, I said, you are from a higher institution. Can you take over? They said, there's no point. It is a gone situation. But <clears throat> we sat with the patient and gradually in a couple of hours on ventilation, the patient uh, started responding. She was weaned off the ventilator within, I think, uh, two, three days. She got well, the cesarean wound got well, uneventful. She had some level of pneumonitis, which got well in next couple of days. And uh, I was very new in a district headquarter. And you see, there's a lot of luck and chance for a young doctor who lands up in a district. The initial cases go wrong. One's carrier may be cooked. But here the message went, look, you know, nobody looked at the negativity that we did not uh, monitor or when did the bradycardia happen, nobody came to know. But everybody said, if there is a complication, here's the guy who can bail it out. And uh, that lady, after five years, again came to us for a repeat section. 20 years later, we did a hysterectomy on her. And uh, lately, I think around four years ago, we drained a cold abscess in her neck. So the point to remember and learn is, well, in today's scenario, open cardiac massage has very limited role. But when required, if you have the skill and the drill, it is feasible in smaller setups and the faith builds. I, I, I cannot forget the gratitude and the thankfulness of Lord that the lady who had cardiac arrest on the same table came three more times uh, to get treated. So that, that, that's one of the worst case scenario I have uh, had in my life. Well. Being a trauma surgeon, I, I have innumerable stories to carry on, but I think for today, keeping the time uh, punctual, uh, that's enough from my side. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, sir, for that wonderful story. Uh, I think uh, that's what medicine tells us, how it is marvelous for each one of us. Uh, thank you so much.
And next we have uh, to introduce us to the uh, teacher of teachers in anesthesia uh, from Chennai. We have uh, Dr. Vasanthi. Thank you so much. And uh, I think it's just wonderful that we're learning so much from all of you. So I'm gonna thank each and every one of you. I feel privileged and blessed to introduce my beloved teacher, Professor V. Nagasam. He is a teacher of teachers in the field of anesthesia in Chennai, not just Chennai, all over India. And in fact, we are going uh, international too. Um, Dr. Nagasami did his MBBS from uh, Stanley Medical College, uh, from uh, Madurai Medical College, and then his post graduation from Stanley Medical College. He has had a meaningful and uh, very successful career in uh, both government and private sector, and he's currently the lead in the DNB program in Railways Hospital. Dr. Nagasami's teaching is not restricted to just classroom conversation or uh, formal classroom training. In fact, his uh, talks in conferences, in meetings, and even day-to-day -day conversations, and I would say even his WhatsApp messages actually tells us a lot and uh, it helps us to learn and grow. This, I feel, directly and indirectly helps, benefits the patients and the society at large because without any hesitation, he imparts his skill, his knowledge, and every aspect of safe anesthesia practice to each and each one of us. He's a strong mentor and has motivate, motivated successful generations of anesthetists to deliver a high standard of teaching and care. And I, I must say, I am a humble beneficiary of this great Bhishmacharya in anesthesia. Thank you so much, sir. We'd love to listen to you. Um. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I share my screen, please? Yes, sir. Um, so, I was asked to speak on the uh, most unforgettable. And of mine. And, uh, sir, uh, sir, could you please uh, mute your second system, sir? I mean, uh, remove, uh, stop the audio of the second system because your voice is uh, uh, echoing. echoing. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, both your mics are off, sir. Your uh, uh, the mic which you're not using, the other devices. Is it better uh, now? Volume. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. So, uh, uh, if I have to recall my most unforgettable patient, it dates back to 1984, as you can see in this picture, uh, in the Hindu supplement, when uh, I had to anesthetize a 14 year old boy with a hand injury like this from E-Road, uh, who suffered loss of three fingers. He came to Stanley for some corrective surgery. And uh, this is a very unforgettable patient because he underwent a microvascular surgery, which was uh, first of its kind done in the entire South India and in Tamil Nadu, and then two in government setup at Stanley Medical College by the team of plastic surgeons who also did it for the first time in their career. And uh, that is the first reason for remembering this patient uh, so well till today. The second reason you will be surprised that this patient was anesthetized for a duration of 15 hours, starting at 9 a.m. in the morning. And you can see me standing there. I went on till almost midnight. And the entire surgery was done with the patient intubated with a red rubber tube and breathing oxygen, nitrous oxide, and ether through the metals or maples and A circuit. You can see the single corrugated tube going to the patient. And after 15 hours of ether inhalation, during that time, we have to refill the boil's vaporizer three times 
to con um, uh, complete the surgery and at the end of the 15th hour the boy woke up nicely except for a bout of vomiting he was very comfortable which showed the power the analgesia produced by ether was so marvelous and the surgery was successfully completed at that